Hey guys, so uh, welcome. My name's Trevor Townsend, CEO of Startup Bootcamp, and uh, welcome you here to uh, um, get this right. Culture shock: the pleasure and pain of corporate startup collaboration. Um, startup Bootcamp, uh, we run accelerator programs, and um, one of our core activities here in Melbourne is both our energy program with our partners Energy Australia, Spotless, Dias, um, and the state government, and also our FinTech program uh, that we're launching with YBF Ventures, state government, and Cap Gemini. Uh, tonight's brought to you by uh, Startup Bootcamp and YBF Ventures, and also the League of Entrepreneurs. Um, and if you're intrigued about the League of Entrepreneurs, you can see Janet, do you want to stand up and wave? Because I think entrepreneurs are very critical to the uh, topic that we're, that we're talking about tonight. Startup Bootcamp was founded to help startup founders scale their businesses. And we do that by bringing together mentors, investors and corporates with the startups. And the first two mentors and investors are actually quite easy to get working with startups. They usually know what they want. The mentors are trying to give back or to give advice or are interested in the technology and so forth. The investors, it's obvious, they're looking for investment uh, opportunities. But what we've found over the years that we've been doing Startup Bootcamp, it's the startup corporate engagement which is really difficult sometimes. And we've seen a lot of value in terms of running the startup engagement program through our accelerators. Uh, to enable the corporates to actually learn how to, um, uh, to deal with startups. And really that's what the topic's about tonight, the pleasure and pain of trying for startups and corporates to, to work together. We're really fortunate tonight to have a moderator, a famous moderator, David Swan uh, from The Australian. Uh, David's a, a tech writer with The Australian, one of Australia's leading newspapers. Um, David's across all, all the whole startup community here in Australia and um, you know, has a deep uh, understanding of, of what's happening in the tech sector, uh, particularly um, you know, with fintechs and, and so forth, and how, um, how this is affecting business and why, um, why it is important. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dave, who will be our moderator for tonight's event. Thanks, Trevor. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. Obviously an incredibly important topic. Um, it's something I've been reporting on a, a lot. And, you know, I've seen startups that, that fail as a result of attempted collaborations with corporate. It's serious business. We're not going to be all serious tonight. Um, I've got a good mix of um, serious questions and more fun stuff as well. Um, we'll get straight into it. I might let each of the panelists introduce themselves uh, one by one. Um, hello, I'm, I'm Nectarius, Greek face, German accent, live in London. Um, um, I'm the co-founder of Startup Bootcamp Fintech. So when Trevor mentioned the Startup Bootcamp started off as a mechanism for helping startups, uh, in 2014 we actually realized that the real value comes in when you bring in both sides of the equation because most of the companies in fintech that we work with are actually B2B businesses, so they need the industry. Uh, we run programs around the world, um, fintech specifically, London, Singapore, New York, Amsterdam, Mumbai, and Mexico City, and every time we talk, the list gets longer, uh, which is beautiful, and we're working on launching a program here. Uh, we have strong views, and hopefully we'll get the opportunity to share them. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. My name is Pat Garrett. Uh, I have a little bit of an American accent that's got 17 years in Australia on it. Um, I am a co-founder of a business called Six Park, which is an online investment management business, which we started building four years ago and launched two years ago. Prior to then, um, I actually came from the corporate world. I was in, at JP Morgan for 10 years in New York and um, then came over and worked at J.P. Morgan here in Australia for a little while before working for a consulting business. And then at the exact time that I wanted to slow things down, about four years ago, I decided uh, with a co-founder to actually start up a business, which was 
complete insanity, it seemed like at the time, but it um, has been a, a, a fascinating journey of highs and lows. Uh, we are a B2C business for the most part now, but working on B2B. So the whole concept of cor corporate collaboration is quite, quite relevant to what we're doing at the moment. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Hi everyone, I'm Kim Anderson and I run NAB Labs. Uh, NAB Labs is ultimately the area of NAB that creates the future of banking. Um, we've been on a three year journey. Uh, we've had some amazing times, but we've also had things that we haven't nailed and we continue to, to learn every day. Um, we cover everything from um, experimentation right through to creating new businesses, whether it's um, creating a corporate startup or working with startups. Um, through to uh, actually um, partnering with other corporates. Um, so we've got a bit of a range of things that we're working through um, and we're currently, and I was actually sitting at home to, today uh, looking at what's our next evolution, um, how do we take it to the next level because no one has, has it nailed, no one has really got it sorted, so you've always got to keep doing your next iteration. So I'm currently doing it right now. Um, and a lot of the feedback that I'm getting, and just talking earlier, of where, where do we go and how do we really work um, with startups in a, in a different way because there's not one way that's going to work. Uh, Kristen Holden from YOB. Uh, I've got a sort of a role which I, I think sort of crosses all the things we're talking about here at the moment. Uh, my job is to actually have an impact in the startup community. So to do things that matter to support the ecosystem and look, ultimately, at the end of the day, they're all businesses that will potentially need us later, so I can take a step back and worry about what's right for them. Um, but working in a corporate, I think it's quite relevant, but look, my background is in running marketing for startups and running agencies and stuff like that, so sort of crossed all these kind of barriers a few times. Cool, thanks guys. And I should note as well, we've got about 15 minutes at the end for um, audience questions. Um, please keep them um, to be not as good as my questions, so you're not upstaging me, <laughs> but still good, but just not as good, because um, I like my job. Um, so we'll have a chat for about 40 minutes or so, and then um, jump into some audience questions. Um, I guess logical place to start would be to, to start a, get a bit of a framework in terms of what your own ideas are of what this collaboration is, and just maybe some examples, either current right now or um, from the recent past in terms of what, what that's looked like, just so we can kind of set the scene a little bit. Are you looking at me? Yeah. We'll go just, yeah. <coughs> um, if I may ask the audience first, who in the room is actually a startup? Raise your hands. Okay, who comes from a bank or financial services organization? The victims? Uh, who, who, what, what does everybody else do? <laughs> Consultants, technology players, a few, wonderful. Um, good. Um, it's relevant. Uh, we started Startup Bootcamp FinTech, or practically within Startup Bootcamp, every industry focused program we do is because we recognize that the industry is struggling to innovate and they think that startups can help. Um, FinTech, the first person I hired in FinTech, I tell people always this as a, as a humorous anecdote, the first person I hired for my program in 2013 thought FinTech is technology from Finland. So the hashtag. <laughs> The hashtag's only been around, the concept of a fintech startup's only been around for about four and a half years. So it's fascinating to see how the discussion has evolved. But interestingly enough, the readiness and the capability hasn't. So we still see that there's a lot of industry curiosity and a lot of stabbing in the dark. But if you take the headline with pleasure and pain, there's not a lot of pleasure and a lot of pain. And that's mainly because people operate on assumptions, people are not very strategic, and therefore there's not a lot of you don't see a lot of results. So for you to acknowledge that you've actually learned a lot and some things didn't work out and nobody's nailed it, you don't get to hear this very often. So our position is really that no matter where you look, and we work with about 70 financial institutions across the globe, we see the bits that don't work and we see the bits where you tell people what they're doing wrong and they're not prepared to listen. So this is the position I'm coming into this with. Yeah, I, I uh, would agree with that sentiment. I guess maybe from my own, my own personal experience, um, I do think it is very early days in terms of effective sort of corporate startup collaboration. Um, and my comment on that would be in part that it's just really, really hard. Uh, I come from somewhat of a corporate background. Uh, I come from um, 
an area where I did venture capital work and work with small companies. So I figured, oh, well, if I'm going to start up one of these small companies, I'll, I'll, I'll have a pretty good idea about the ways to approach corporates and to, and to uh, make things move qu a little quicker and whatnot. And then I get into the startup world and I realize just how complex and hard and difficult it is. And then go out and try to have some dialogues with some of these uh, corporates to get you know, distribution scale like everybody tries to do. And if you learn very, very quickly that it's phenomenally, phenomenally complex. It's phenomenally hard. There's cultural issues. There's technical issues. There's strategic issues. Um, one organization is kind of functioning in one way and another is functioning in a totally different way. And trying to bridge those two um, takes a lot of work, takes a phenomenal amount of patience, and takes a lot more time, I think, than anyone thinks. And uh, it was sort of stated to me, so I've still, but it's, it's, the, it's a marriage, not a one-night stand. And um, if it's treated like a one-night stand, it's going to end up the same sort of result. So uh, <laughs> it might be fun for a little while, but it's not going to last. Um, so anyway, I, I, I think th these kind of events are great because what people need to learn is exactly how, how hard and difficult it is and what it takes so that there's a realistic view of how, to, of how to approach them and some of the thought processes that go into it. Thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, we've worked with startups in, in probably about five different ways, um, and I'll just touch on a couple. Um, so we obviously invest and partner with startups. Um, we uh, have reinvented some of our products to help um, with um, unsecured lending for um, startups. We've also um, used them as, as suppliers for pain points that we know we can't fix in a fast way, um, through to um, creating our own startup. So literally hiring a team of entrepreneurs that are um, creating their own startup that is separated from the mothership, that is separated from our processes and our ways of working. Um, and then lastly, and we were just talking about it earlier, um, how do you continue to um, build out your API um, developer portal and, and just let them work how they currently work and not try to change um, how they operate um, but, but provide you with you know, a two-way um, uh, process almost of creating things that you can't create but allowing them to access the things that you, you feel um, make sense to, to be sharing more broadly. Um, so I think there's, there's not one way um, that you can do it, but I think there's some of those uh, out of those five are, are more successful than others depending on your alignment of values, um, your alignment of um, understanding how to um, you know, keep tracking a way across a large organisation that just has so many different policies and processes and frameworks. Um, and I, I gave an example to Pat last night. Um, there's a particular startup that we've worked with for quite a number of years now, MediPass Solutions. And I use this example quite a bit because um, the reality of this one was it was an ex-NAB employee, employee who won a hackathon, had already founded a company of his own. Um, he was, had this other great idea knowing some of the pain points at NAB um, and created a, a business off the end of this hackathon. Now, he knows NAB back to front. He understands how we operate. He knows everyone who works there. But yet, it was still was tough to really um, continue scaling this business. And he's been quite successful, has an amazing team, an amazing um, opportunity that has, has really blossomed as part of um, the relationship. But it was still bloody hard. And um, you know, we still joke about it today because he was a NAB employee, so it's not like he didn't have those strong connections, that strong values, the strong ways of working and understanding one another, and it was still hard. Um, so I, I just think it is one of those things that will keep evolving, and you've got to have that patience to, to work through those dynamics, but also recognise when it's not working. Um, and I think that's, that's sort of where we're at now, of knowing what's the right way to interact, depending on what you're trying to achieve. I'll be quick because a lot of what I've said just been was thinking has just been said, but I think that they just run at such different speeds. It's very difficult to get them to speak the same language or the same anything most of the time, um, and the risk profiles are so different. It's very hard. Like that's why you've almost got to ring fence the two completely and have like a translator in the middle, 
you know, that's almost my job at the moment is to be that interface between the two because I, I don't want them speaking to the corporate side of things because then they'll go, this is too hard or it's too whatever or, you know, th these kind of... It scares startups away and it scares the corporates away as well. They both sort of get this fear of where it's leading. So I think being open is the best way I've seen to do it. Just have an API, let people build on what you do. Just let them run loose and obviously have some checks in place, but... I don't know a better way. Look, you look at some of the biggest tech startups in the world, they still balls it up all the time and buy companies and try and bring them in and it's a disaster. They end up shutting them down. Google does it all the time. They buy a company for $10 billion and it's gone in two years. You know, they just end up with the talent. So even the best companies in the world can't do it properly. It's, it's, it hasn't been solved. Do you think that's intentional? I think sometimes it maybe is an acquisition hire sort of thing, but I think for the most part they don't really want to lose all the customers of the business or... They could be buying it because so a competitor doesn't get it, things like that. But, I mean, clearly they don't want to shut them all down. Like Yahoo is a great example. They don't think they ever bought anything that really worked, apart from Alibaba. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Um, you, just, you just described pretty much the difficulties that you face sometimes. The frustration that I have, and I'm not, I'm not looking at you as a representative of NAB, but a representative of a bank, um, is that usually when you have these conversations and you ask, so okay, what can you do about it? You very rarely hear the banks going, well, we have contributed to that. It's always something wrong with the startups. They were too early stage, they don't understand the business, they don't understand the complexity, they don't understand that they need to interface with different people or the politics, and it's very rarely that you hear somebody say, actually, the same way that the startup needs to become corporate ready, we as a corporate need to become startup ready. And that's a big frustration because that conversation in 2012, 2013, fair enough. 2018, still having this conversation, sometimes it's eye-opening that you go, guys, wake up. This is, it, th that excuse no longer flies. Um, small fact, fun fact, the average age of a founder in startup bootcamp fintech across the globe is 38. To your point, these are not the 20-year-olds uh, who build cool stuff in garages because that's, we're not talking about a payments wallet sharing app. Usually these are complex solutions that are built for enterprises, right? So at some point, we hope that there's this wake-up call on the corporate side to go, you know what, we actually need to do some on our own re something about our own readiness. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm looking at you, Kim. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up on a point that Kim, you made about um, sometimes NAB, you, you decide to start your own companies and you'll have a team of entrepreneurs. When does it make sense for you to, to spin up um, a new business versus acquiring or, or partnering? Um, is it a cheaper option? Is it um, what, what's going on there where that's the, the best bet? Yeah, look, um, this is a bit of my sort of pet experiment at the moment, but um, I've got a strong belief that you do need to move away from your core business um, to, to really evolve, and you can't do that within the core business. Um, so, yeah. Typically, we would look at it where it doesn't need strong interconnections into to the mothership um, and where you really need to have that ability to go off and, and run in a very different way. Um, and you can't necessarily do that when you've got um, the rest of the company saying, but we don't do that. Um, that's not how we do it like around here. It's too hard or, you know. So, you know, um, this, this particular one, um, I've been really passionate about ensuring that we hired a team and not individuals. And I, I spent a good six months really targeting um, people that had specialisation, but knowing that they will need to interact with corporates. So I didn't go, I'm just going to hire everyone who's worked in startups. I went, who needs to have that startup bent in their role? And to really move it at a pace and who is actually going to need to interact with a lot of corporates and know their language and know how to operate but still has that ability to move at, at speed. So you do really need to think about, um, you don't just do it for the sake of doing it, yeah. you do it because it will be more successful if it's isolated and not held back by your current construct. Yeah. And for the panel, Obviously, you, have, you see and you've had a lot of conversations between corporates and startups. What questions do, do corporates generally ask of startups when they're looking to, to maybe collaborate? Um, and are they asking the right questions? Um, most of the questions um, 
revolve around um, how scalable a business is and how quickly you can um, have an impact on revenues or profit. Yeah. Um, and most will ask the right questions around um, have you done your right homework as to, as to what, our, what our problem is. And I think um, to maybe take slightly the, the, in the defense of the, the corporate side, is in one, of the, one of the things I learned is that um, I, I, despite having a bit of a background in the corporate environment, I, I found myself susceptible at times in going in and talking with potential corporate partners of having the blinkers on, of being so emotionally embedded, in, in, invested in what for several years um, we, we, we'd put together that I would go into a meeting thinking about what, you know, my product or our product and what it did and why it was great and maybe not enough homework on what problem is the corporate have and what are we trying to solve and if I've, have I gone in with that mentality because um, that's true collaboration, right? And so usually the problem or usually the questions I get is uh, tend to focus on does, does this person sitting in front of me actually understand what my pain point is and what my problem is? Um, because they might have something that's great, but if it doesn't address my need, there's no real point in having this conversation. Um, so it, 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 it is usually around stress testing the assumptions behind, you know, what problems it can solve for us. I hear a lot of the wrong questions, things about like, what's your, how much money do you have in the bank? Are you going to be around in 12 months? You know, like this long sales cycle of will you be here in two years to support us instead of is the idea right? It's almost a bit too much on the opposite side of the fence. Um, I heard a lot of those kind of questions started to be asked. Like, it's not like this is a cool solution that will fix us. It's does Salesforce have something that's similar that we can sort of make work or is this cool startup, can we risk it on them? It's almost that risk is, is too much for, to, for a lot of big corporates to really jump head in with. And I don't know if you people have worked with banks and work with big whatever, and that's always what it's about. It's about feeling out the founders and their background instead of is their product right. I find a lot of that goes on, a lot of risk mitigation. Because um, obviously it's a big decision to choose a product or a service and integrate with it and you know jump in together. Um, I find a lot of that happens a little bit too much for the startups because they, you know, they're not those kind of people. They might be an ideas person. They don't have $5 million in the bank. They don't have 20 staff, whatever. But I think there's a lot of opportunities to get lost in that sort of stage. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, the, the, it's a very valid question to ask about CAC and long-term value of, of, of a client. And, and anyone in a startup position needs to have a good answer to that question fairly long term, but it's most likely that in the startup phase, those are really ugly numbers for a little while. <laughs> and so you have to, in the, I think in the corporate mindset, be able to, um, and the unfortunate reality with most corporates is they are, that, that there's immense amount of pressure on, you know, quarterly results and, and um, uh, near term, near term results. And if, if the cost to acquire a client and the lifetime value of a client economics don't look great or aren't, aren't easily, easily articulated um, and defended and proven out, then it's pretty easy to say no. Um, and, and the reality is you, you, you have to have a certain leap of faith and it's all about that sort of element of risk and strategic thinking as opposed to near-term thinking. Can I add another lens on this? Um, because you're talking about startups generically and corporates generically. Most startup to corporate conversations happen between people that shouldn't be talking to each other. Um, because you get the business heads who go to these events and meet a startup, they get excited, they have no idea, right? At the same time, if you understand where you sit within the organization and you have a remit, then you also understand that an early stage startup gives you a certain value, which may not be a commercial value, but it gives you experimentation and learning and whatever it is, and you add value back by validating the proposition, by giving them pointers about things that may not work and kind of open their eyes to the complexity. A more mature company will give you a very different value. But unfortunately, lots of these conversations happen in a very kind of uniform way and suddenly you get confusion and both parties walk away from each other going, oh, you don't get me. Because there are very justified questions about customer acquisition costs and long-term value, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't ask this to an early stage founder who's just come up with the most amazing solution. 
You ask them when they've validated the business, proven that it works. When we work with the startups, what we tell them, especially because in the accelerators we work with relatively early stage companies, we go, the first thing you'll do is just validate all your assumptions. That's the value you get out of the program. That's where you'll meet the head of a business. Don't sell to them because they're not going to buy anyway. You're too early for them. You, you can't even, even touch the procurement process, let alone have a chance getting through it, right? But once you've established that, you manage to kind of have a reasonable product market fit and you have something that is a real proposition, then we can start talking figures. But unfortunately, that's not what happens. And then you get these founders who meet, oh, I'm at the head of whatever at XYZ Bank. And then they go from meeting to meeting to meeting. And six months later, they get frustrated because they've been talking to the banks and nothing happens. Broadly speaking, how do you guys feel about collaborating as a startup with... with one partner and putting all your eggs in one basket and working closely together versus trying to be as broad as possible and say, I'm open to working with anybody and, and in, in a general sense, what approach do you think is smarter? Uh, well, I, th I think that probably depends on the business model and how e easy it is to white label and be more of a software as a service type model. Our, our, um, our business model is one where um, we'd probably l look to partner with a small group of large entities, um, and, and that's just our that's just our situation. I don't think there is a, a right answer there. I think it I, th I think it depends on the the type of product you have and what your target market is and what your target par partnership market is, and so there's a right answer for one type versus the other. I think the I think the answer, though, really fundamentally, is how, how do you make the best use of your resources to scale quickly as possible with the least amount of risk? So that's kind of an obvious an, an obvious answer, and in and how likely is the receiving end of that market ready to 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 sort of to partner up and to take you seriously? Uh, and how easy if you've proven out, um, as Nectar said, to sort of the proof the proof points. Where's the most likely um, uh, recipient going to respond to that? And if it's if it's one big one, that's what you go for. But there's going to be inherent risks there. Uh, and if it's a bunch of smaller ones, then you you, you draw that you go that avenue. Yeah. You said what I've said basically. I mean, I've I've run agencies which had two giant clients and I've screwed myself in, in that and, you know, got bitten by that. But it was good while it lasted. But, you know, when you've, we're on, on the gravy train we have got a couple of big clients and they're paying all the bills, you don't really think as lean as you should, right? You're not innovating as much. You're not thinking about, you know, the long term. If one of them leaves, is it, what's the risk? Are you planning for it? So obviously, you know, it's better to have 50 small clients than two big clients to make up the same revenue. But... Depends if you're selling to an enterprise or if you're selling to a bank or if you're, you know, servicing mum and dad businesses, really. It's going to depend on that. I think, there w I think one thing that I would add there is an imperative for a, a startup to think about is um, to do your absolute best to be able to stand alone on your two feet before you go and have those conversations. Because uh, whether it's with one or many, um, if you rush the process to try to have the partnership be your answer to survival, you're going into a discussion at a very significant disadvantage. You're, you're, it's probably, it's, you don't have a lot of leverage in that conversation. So I think the, the first thing to do is to show as much as possible that you can stand on your own two feet, even if it's going to take you quite a lot longer and, and um, uh, be more difficult than have a good funding strategy behind it to get there, but have that bed down, bedded down as much as possible, whether it's one big one or a whole bunch of small ones, before you go out, because that then becomes a much more fundable strategy uh, and a, just a more likely to succeed. I think this is where the side hustle comes in as well, like not jumping headfirst into something, having, you know, Having another source of income and testing these things out on the side is what a lot of people do now. You know, they have their they work f ten hours a week on their startup and try and get it off the ground instead of just jumping headfirst into it. That's now sort of the way people do this. They mitigate their risk by having a job, which they might get paid to learn the similar skills they're going to use on their startup. You know, they might be working for an enterprise while they're working on a SaaS product or whatever. I think that's a bit more common these days. We actually don't like that. We don't like that. We don't like that at all. That's where we put on our investor lens, right? 
Yeah, so what we want is full commitment because you need to move fast. And if you do this at night, and if you don't dedicate your heart, because ultimately we get excited by entrepreneurial spark, but a real belief that you really want to change the world through automating back office process and whatever, right? <laughs> it sounds ironic, but it is, that's what we want. So I understand the point from a, if you, if you have a job and you really kind of want to test the water, but we really want the people to kind of take a risk because that's what makes them the entrepreneur. Otherwise, they're just, because the other thing that people do normally who keep their jobs is also building things differently. Because one of the things about a startup is you follow kind of, you embrace the whole lean startup methodology, et cetera, is you build a little thing, you validate it, you keep building, right? When you come from the corporate world, what you usually do is, and we see this all the time, we've got events like this. I'm sure somebody in the audience here is in the corporate world. You started building something in your spare time. You put a lot of money into it. You probably outsource your dev to another shop and you built the Rolls Royce with all the bells and whistles because that's what the corporate world expects from you. But that's not what true entrepreneurs do. You just build a small little thing, put all your fire behind it, and get people to love it. And you pivot and pivot and pivot until you've got the perfect fit, and then you keep going, and that's what's going to help you raise money. Slightly different perspective. In a practical sense, if I'm a startup founder, and I never will be, ever, um, <laughs> just for the record, <laughs> I'm staying away from that. No offense to anybody who wants to do that, just not for me. Um, what, what should I do in a practical sense to ensure the best chance of a successful collaboration? Obviously, there's homework. Obviously, there's wearing my nicest tie. What, what am I doing and, and who should I try to speak to within an organization if I have the idea that I would love to collaborate with them? Um, look, very, very good question. Um, I've got... Um, both people that I'm working with, with inside work and outside of work and, and a couple of things I always suggest is first of all understand what are the pain points you're solving for those companies before you go there. Don't go with a generic I've got a pitch I'm going to solve all your problems and not know what their problems are. Um, so always start with what is that that burning problem that they are trying to solve. Um, the second thing I, I always say is really find out who the decision makers are. Don't just go to anyone who is willing to have a meeting with you um, because you will be shopped around and it does happen and the amount of times I hear it and I think you mentioned it too, Pat. Um, you can spend hours just meeting lots of people that are really excited by what you're doing and I'm sure that they you know, want to help you but they don't know how to or you know, they've got to get it through 10 other people before um, <laughs> there's actually a decision made. Um, and probably the third thing that... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always a bit difficult, but, you know, find out what their process is. Um, so every corporate has a very different um, process and find out what, what are the 10 steps, what are those actual key points that you need to get through before you're, you're actually really approved? Because there's, there's a lot of startups that I talk to that I go, yeah, I'm, you know, I've got this one interested in this one and this one, and I'm like, but there's interest and then there's a decision. And you really need to know what point you're at and what other things that will need to, to happen. So, for instance, you know, security reviews, procurement reviews, legal. Um, there's, there's so many aspects that some people, particularly if they've never done a startup before, um, just actually don't know what those steps are. Um, and, and sometimes it's just not clearly laid out. So, you know, having those honest conversations up front to actually know what how do you work with, with startups? Who's actually the decision makers? What do I need to go through? So you can save yourself quite a bit of heartache. <laughs> yeah, I, I would, um, you took most of the words out of mouth, but I'd, I, 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 one thing I would add, um, Australia is different than the US and overseas, but one thing that I would add is, is to um, look abroad for the startup, is to look abroad for precedent because a lot of times things happen overseas a couple of years before they happen here. And it, it was interesting to hear a little bit um, from Kirsten about how my office responded so well um, innovation-wise in many ways and culture-wise, but largely because Zero and, and uh, is it, was it Intuit, uh, Intuit ca came in and it basically scared the shit out of them. And, and in my industry, for example, the banks... Um, who we might want to partner with, in my mind, there should be great reason why they'd be thrilled to death to have a product like what we have. But there's probably just not that sense of urgency yet. 
Um, so one of the things I would, as part of the answer, I would say is do your homework and look overseas and see what's been triggers and catalysts and examples of, of where that sense of urgency has come from and then try to tap, try to tap into that and just to get the more engaged conversation sooner rather than later. I have to. This is our bread and butter. Um, listen to the grown-ups. <laughs> There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of people who have experience in that. There's an element of humility that has to come with the confidence and the arrogance that you have to have as, as an entrepreneur. But feedback is super valuable. But at the same time, there's going to be a lot of people who have a lot of opinions. You also need to develop a bit of a kind of a BS gauge to know where to draw the line. That's one thing. The other one is you really need to solve a problem. You need to have a very clear proposition to the value. If you don't solve a problem, if it's something cool, and you go, oh, we could do this, we could do that, forget it. That's not the point. You need to go into something with a very clear, this is why I'm helping you. The third one is really all about don't sell all the time. This is so crucial. And we have to, with every entrepreneur that comes into the program, we have to go through this brainwashing exercise, right? If you need to build a product that makes sense for the industry, you need to have conversations where you sacrifice the sales opportunity to talk to somebody who will give you very open, candid feedback about the processes, about the details um, within the company, etc. So that constant sales mode is just causing problems. Thorny question. Um, is collaboration with, with startups sometimes a, a cop-out from embedding innovation throughout the entire organization? Open to anybody. I think a lot of time corporates just, if you have to hire a head of innovation, it almost seems like it doesn't work. Everyone's got to be involved in trying to be innovative. Like you can't have 80% of people not being innovative and then 20% of people running around with post-it notes trying to be cool. It's got to come from the ground up. Um, that, that's all I'd say. It needs to be that mentality from the very from the bottom up, not the top down as well in terms of innovation. So I do think it is a little bit of a cop out, the whole innovation thing. Um, everybody should be innovating all the time, and sometimes, and you put it a bit differently to me, but you know, sometimes competition will help you innovate differently. Like you know, is your timeline five years, and all of a sudden it becomes six months? You know, or something news launching or whatever, that, that will drive innovation more than anything else, more than someone saying we should be innovative. Um, the market forces will drive that more than anything. I have a slightly different opinion on that one. Um, I do think if you're a digital native company and you've, you've, you've built that into your DNA from day one, yes, I agree that you shouldn't, shouldn't create an innovation team or an innovation hub. Um, I wasn't a believer before I took this job. Um, I, I was in a product team going, why are we creating an innovation hub? You know, we, we should just all be learning this. But the pace um, to change the DNA needs to be accelerated. Um, and you know, particularly companies that have been around a long, long period of time, um, you can't just go, our DNA is changing tomorrow. We've, we've changed. Um, so, so for me, um, you know, I actually had to be convinced to take this job, um, but once I got into it, I realised how much you can really have that flow-on effect. Um, so we have a philosophy that we don't do an experiment unless there's people from across NAB in that experiment and, and it's part of really driving it um, and owning the vision, owning what, what you're doing. Um, and otherwise we won't do it. Um, and that has a flow-on effect because they'll come in, they'll spend you know, six weeks minimum learning how to really drive something from scratch. It's their whole job, similar to what you described, it has to be 100% of their time. Um, and then if, if it gets off the ground, and get, they get the traction, they get the buy-in from the right people across um, NAB, they can keep driving it. Um, they have that opportunity to, to take that on. So that does have a flow-on effect um, or if it doesn't, they go back to their team and, and they talk about it. Like, just even on our intranet today, I was really excited. Um, we've had bankers come through who don't traditionally even think about innovation at all. Um, and we had a banker come in going, you know, here's some of the processes that are just driving us nuts. I'm like, well, you own it. You drive it. Um, and he said he learnt more in six weeks than he'd learned in, like, six years. Um, and, and I just was sort of proud that he said that. Um, but it was just because he goes, I didn't think I could do this. And I didn't think I could actually drive this amount of change. 
Um, so we, we are a bit of a symbol, um, yes, from the, the get-go, but you've got to change it from being um, PR to how do you actually teach new ways of working, new mindsets, and have that flow-on effect and constantly be thinking about how do you have that DNA being spread, um, and, and action is the main way. Not, yes, you've got to talk about it, and, and I do talk about it a lot, um, but then really showing the action is where I find people really change. I think we're both actually very aligned. I think I just said it differently. You're sort of you're empowering everyone to be innovative and it's not you're not driving it like you're out there doing this stuff and giving them the tools to do it but you're actually empowering a banker at the very low level to be innovative and to think differently right like that's sort of what I was trying to say is that you've got to actually let everyone be empowered and the random guy in accounts at the back who would never normally get a say to come and say I've got an idea and let him run it and that's where the real innovation comes from I think is sort of what I was trying to say. And I think um, in addition to the teaching that you referred to, um, Char Charlie Munger, um, Warren Buffett's sidekick, said, show me the incentive and I'll show you, I'll show you the outcome or something along those lines. And I, it don't necessarily mean financial incentive, although that tends to be the case a lot of the times. But I think if institutionally the concept of rewarding for innovation um, in some way, shape, or form is, is, is actually institutionalized with other aspects of the business in terms of value and culture and whatnot, um, that that is an absolutely cr critical component, that it should be just, of, just an incentivizing for somebody in HR to think about ways to improve their outcome as it is for somebody on sales to hit the you know, top or bottom line. I have to disagree with you guys. Um, not the individuals. Um, let, let's be real. Again, we're mixing things, right? Most organizations do innovation without understanding what they're doing. A lot of the initiatives, when you ask any person who does innovation, whatever that means, it's a bit of a stab in the dark without any metrics for success. And I'm, I'm generalizing, right? We had a conversation yesterday. We know what you guys are doing. It's actually really laudable and impressive. At the same time, if you try and see what results have been kind of have come to the surface, people start getting a bit blurry. And if they're sitting on panels, usually another candidate is Kim, they give you some sort of comps pre-approved answer which has absolutely no substance. Reality is that nobody's figured it out and most people don't even bother trying to build a real innovation strategy. Innovation strategy means something very concrete. It has to be aligned to the group strategy but it has to be relevant for each individual business unit in a different way because the head of the SME bank has different needs from the head of the wealth management business and a group innovation head can never do this which is all on the kind of product side if you like and services side but it has to be underpinned with internal innovation processes and the two never talk to each other because you bring the people into the colorful rooms with the beanbags and post-its, they go away inspired and then they go back into their normal processes and nothing moves. At the same time, there's governance. <laughs> Banks are not incentivized, so shareholders don't expect innovation, they just expect returns. And it returns are measured on a quarterly basis. So again, why would somebody in a really senior position bother to dedicate time and budget to do something when they know that three years down the line they will be somewhere else? And I'm being very cynical because we see it time and time again. And since I've got the mic, there's one more thing, which is you mentioned it briefly, right? Which is, which is uh, you invest in startups. I would like to see one bank globally who has a venture fund to show me how a strategic investment that they've made actually ended up being strategic. Because the people who run most, and again, present company excluded, the people who run most corporate venture funds for banks are not VCs. If there were superstar VCs, there would be a VC, not a corporate VC. So usually it's some people from M&A and other departments in the bank who want to do something cool, they have a bunch of money that's not their own, there's no risk, uh, they lose the tie, they travel to Silicon Valley and they invest. And they call them strategic because they have some sort of relevance to the bank. But if the bank doesn't do their homework to build a mechanism that allow these companies then to transition into the business, nothing's going to happen. Ten days ago, Money 2020 Amsterdam, I was sitting next to a guy who did exactly that. He was investing and then he was complaining that the companies that he's invested in, the business doesn't care about. And you go, so how strategic is that made? But reality is, the few banks that have tried it, usually what they've done is, is the ones who are doing it better, 
I said, you know what? It's either going to be a pure venture game. It's all about returns. So we're not going to have the strategic lens. And there's a few who've actually shifted. BBVA started BBVA Ventures. Now it's called Propel VC. And it's just a VC in a good way. And some just keep going. And there's 100 million US here and 200 million US there that is just wasted money. And nothing comes out of this in a strategic way from an innovation perspective. And now I'm stepping off my soapbox. Um, well, it, uh, to my theme of sort of looking overseas, and, and I think this maybe illustrates how f far Australia still has to go a little bit. Um, I wouldn't focus so much on the corporate VCs um, construct so much because it can, um, I, I would sort of forget a, use just an example, say, of, of Goldman Sachs, which I'm sure has its own internal uh, VC arm, but, but may, maybe not formally. Well, they've developed uh, an offering called Marcus, and uh, I would say that that's probably turned so it's turning into a fairly strategic um, service for them, and they're investing a lot of money in it, and it's growing. And I, th I would say it's there's one example of one that's I don't know if they've got it right yet. It's probably too early to tell, but I would say there's an example of of um, where progress is being made. Of course, we had to mention the one example that has really worked. Uh, <laughs> plus, Goldman's have got better at it. And Goldman's are Goldman's for, the, for a reason, right? And it's, it's not, I mean, Marcus is a super example for a company that really has figured out how to approach things by investing into businesses and getting value out of it. But the number of conversations I have with really senior people in the bank who would say verbatim, we do innovation, we have a venture fund that invests in startups, that's the ones who will never get a Marcus. And this is a frustration. So I'm totally with you on the Marcus bit. And there's a few organizations who started figuring it out and are getting better and better at it. So hopefully there will be more. So it's a call to arms, if you like. We've got um, about 15 minutes for some audience questions. So um, yeah, we'd love to, to throw open to the audience. I think that's what we talked about before. It's opening up and just having an API and not interfering with them. It's like, here's the keys, here's the rules. You build what you want that's complementary to what we're doing. And I mean, we've invested in some of those businesses and we've bought some complementary things and that's sort of the way we identify some of these things is they, they're already working with us and it's working well and they've solved a customer need. So just sort of leaving them to what they do. I mean, we have Kieran, I'm not sure if you've met, but some of the other people here have met Kieran. Um, and he, he goes around and like looks after that community and just makes sure they're getting what they need and we're doing what we need to do to service them and just sort of leaving them to it. That's a, a good and it's a more scalable approach as well for a business like ours. We're, we've moved to being a platform company instead of just being and you know having one product. There's 400 or so businesses that build on top of ours now. So I guess that's our approach and that's the best way we've figured it out to do it. Um, my name is Julia Seal. I um, spent 20 years delivering projects for corporates, mostly technology, fintech, dabbled in aviation, too big for my liking, left. Um, I've got a couple of observations that I hope are going to manifest in the question. The first is if corporates knew how to deliver projects themselves, they would be doing it and they wouldn't need startups. Right, so that's the first observation. They're crap at delivering. They're crap at delivering because they like control, they don't embrace the freedom. And then the third observation is that behind all of that is ultimately trust, right? Um, startups believe in what they're doing, they can run fast because they're believed and they're aligned. Corporates generally have processes, Kim, to your point, processes, controls, governance, they want the checks and balances before the belief kicks in. So somewhere between those two ends of the spectrum is probably the right, the right answer. But um, at my time when I was at Telstra, I saw a lot of startups come to us thinking that they could be the hamster, right, and deliver hamsters. But what Telstra actually wanted was a hamster that could deliver an elephant. You know, it's sort of the two, two ends of the spectrum. Does that make sense? 
Give so five second answer yeah. and then pass it on. Yeah. I, as I've just been through this process, I think there's a lot of people that mean well, that are innovative, that can deliver a lot of stuff in corporates, but they've lost, they've, they've developed this fear because they're used to working in a corporate. I don't think it's really about whether they've got the right mentality or the right skills or not quite often. It's just the fact that big corporates work at a slower pace because they've got bigger risk profiles and more to lose and they've got ASX results to meet and whatever. Um, so I don't think they, that they can't deliver it. I just think they almost forget how sometimes and that's where a lot of this stuff comes back in because there's a lot of good people trying to do a lot of good things at these businesses, is all I'd say. Yeah, um, I, I've talked to quite a lot about this with my team and, and there was a story that uh, we, we talked about <laughs> recently, my team. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. There's a glass, of, there's a glass and um, it has a flea in it, um, but it's got a lid on, on the glass and every time the flea tries to get out, it hits the lid and, and, and it can't get out. And there's another glass and the flea can just get out. Um, and the, the reason why we, we talked about this story was if you keep getting hit in the head every time you try to do something differently, um, you won't do it. And it doesn't matter, and, and I've, I've had entrepreneurs come in, I've had you know, people that are amazing brains, but they get hit in the head. And they're, so they're like, oh, I can't, I can't do that. Um, so you do have to get that openness to... I know we were talking about it earlier, that positivity that you can do something um, and not constantly be hit in the head every time you try. Um, you know, I, I've hired some, some, some amazing people and, and uh, recently there was something that just didn't kind of keep going through and I'm like, what happened there? They're like, oh, I just, it was just got too many no's. And I'm like, well, actually, you've got to get used to no's and you've got to stop the no's letting you not progress. Um, and be comfortable that you're going to constantly get that and you've got to actually try and change that negativity into positivity. I think it's that failure is not as often accepted at corporates as well. Like, you're not allowed to fail. It's this big corporate culture that's different to a startup. If you follow the big innovation thinkers, they actually don't talk about technology changes anymore. They only talk about organi organizational change, culture, and governance. So that's to your point, but that's a different panel session, I guess. But it, it's, oh, hello. I think I have the mic. <laughs> Janet Egba, yeah, from the League of Entrepreneurs. And um, thank you for that comment, because that's a beautiful segue into where I'm heading. So. Uh, and Ektaris, I think you started with what is the startup readiness we need to see in these corporates. Corporates are made of people. They're made of individuals. And it's what type of mindset and culture we need in these individuals to be ready to engage and work more effectively with startups. Because I think the two really need uh, each other. So for me, it's more around this culture of how do we keep building a stronger ecosystem of entrepreneurs. Those are a little bit different breed of business leaders working within corporates. They are the ones that are going to help us, I guess, get to become more startup ready to work with them. So that's my question. Uh, I, I refer to my example earlier about this one night stand in the, in, in the marriage, and I think it's a two way street. I think um, you make a very good point about a, ch a subtle change sort of at the corporate level. And I'll refer to Nectarius's point about how the startups need to not constantly be in sales mode, actually have to walk into the dialogue with a sense, with a bit of maturity and realism um, about the fact that this is a dialogue and a relationship that's being built. And as much enthusiasm as I may have about the product, that will come to the fore eventually. But it's sort of the startup needs to take on a bit of a more mature view of itself in the world and the corporate needs to take on a little bit more of an entrepreneur view and the two just slowly sort of hopefully start to merge a little bit more. Yep. I'm not 100% certain there's a dearth of creativity within our financial institutions. Um, if we look in recent times, just about every one of the big four banks has announced that they've built some great new small business SME unsecured lending platform because that's where all the new fintech action is. What is probably not 
advertised as widely is the horrendous cost that they've incurred internally to deliver those tools. Um, I, you know, I won't spread rumours around that, but you know, most of them are in the tens of millions of dollars. And you contrast that to the number of fintechs, which, which I'm sure there might be some here in the room, have set up businesses for tiny fractions of that. And I think, you know, in the corporates, they call innovation just a project, and it's a big project. And um, you know, for many fintechs, the competition is, in fact, the bank's own IT department. And uh, we see, you know, increasingly, you know, NAB is an example. Announced they're going to sack 6,000 people, but recruit 2,000 more for technology skills. So theoretically, that trend is going to increase, where the banks will look to do a lot of this internally. And um, to me, I think one of the key challenges with corporates and, and uh, fintechs is the corporates will invariably do some things better, but there'll be many things they won't do better. The, the challenge will be the performance metric around that, and I don't think the corporates are yet at the performance metric of evaluating those internal projects compared to what the competing alternative would be. Um, you know, a $20 million project to develop a small business loan versus some fintech that's already got one active and originating business that probably might have cost them uh, literally probably 10% of that. Could that have been a better proposition? And, and how is that evaluated within the corporate framework? So you know, I guess my general question would be, I, I think our banks are actually doing stuff internally. I, I just think the allocation of resources and the evaluation of success probably needs to be revisited. Um, there's a few parts of that question, but um, <laughs> so I guess um, as I was talking about earlier, I'm really passionate about um, creating um, you know, tr true startups that, that that build these businesses. Um, so some of what I have seen is sometimes um, they they end up creating these big project teams to deliver innovation, and I'm like, well you're not really changing how you're operating, you're not really changing the cost structure. So, you know, how do you have teams of four that are actually doing what a team of 20 would traditionally do um, on a product team? Um, and, and, and reducing that cost by not necessarily using your internal teams as well. Because a lot of the cost, is, to be honest, is internal cost. Um, so it's not just the, the resources you're paying for, it's the cost to integrate into crazy old systems and you know infrastructure that that it really shouldn't be used anymore so reducing the cost by really looking at how do we build this in isolation um, how do we um, really create businesses without needing to to, to your point earlier rely on um, being able to stand on your own two feet it's I guess what you were saying Pat, Pat. how do you stand your own, on your own two feet without needing the mothership for everything because as soon as you need the mothership for everything, that's when it gets expensive for what you're trying to do. And I guess the only thing I would add to that is the, sort of my reference to earlier is that the, that the impetus for the banks to, to critically analyze the question you just asked will be when they truly feel threatened. And I don't think that's happened yet. So I've got um, a question for Nectarius. Um, you've got a global role. Australia is known at, uh, of, of having the worst in the OECD for uh, industry research collaboration and it hasn't improved over uh, the last seven years. Uh, as a startup, what other countries could we look to to partner with corporates? Um, we didn't talk about Australia, did we? Um, so we, we observed something in Australia which I think, I, I used to work here by the way, I have some license to talk about it uh, for four years in, in the banking world. Um, in Australia, people don't look at the world standard, they just look what the other three are doing. Um, and usually you just get a little bit better incrementally, but reality is you don't see much. Um, it's really difficult for a founder here. Depending on your stage, you have to work with the local market first because you need to start growing locally, right? I mean, the big markets where we see companies doing it better is, uh, of course, the UK is a fintech hub. I have to fly the flag despite Brexit. Um, the US is an interesting market, but it's very distinctly different. And let's not forget, if you're building a fintech business, you need to have access to the regulator. The UK has got an amazing regulator with the FCA, Singapore has got an amazing regulator with the MAS, in Australia you've got an amazing regulator who's trying to do the right things, in the US, forget it, 
It's midnight, right? If you go to places like Germany and France who are trying to position themselves as fintech hubs, again, the regulatory aspect is really difficult, but then in the Nordics, you have a spirit of collaboration where once you start working with one bank, they're really open to work with another. The Netherlands as well have got a program in Amsterdam, so it's, a, it's, it's not a simple answer. But if I were a founder to found a business, depending on my business line, I would just look at the next big market, and it could be the UK, it could be... Uh, we've talked about this yesterday. There's also another kind of slightly messed up thing here where... As an Australian founder, you have a cultural affinity to the Anglo-Saxon world, and you've got a geographical affinity to Southeast Asia. And people don't necessarily know how to navigate that. But if you have a business that is a retail-focused business and you want to address a large audience and you don't need regulation, go to Indonesia. But if you need regulation, maybe not, because Indonesia is really difficult. So there's so many difficult questions to ask. Um, Unfortunately, in Australia, once you start working with one of the big players, it's really difficult to imagine how you can sell your solution to some of the others, though. So your growth is somewhat, somewhat muffled. Hi. Um, my question actually comes from a friend who works in, like, innovating for corporates. And she had a really good point that, you know, corporates actually outsource their innovation a lot of the time because... It means that when someone internally would otherwise fail, they would lose their job. But otherwise, it's just cancelling of a contract, and oftentimes that's much easier. I'm curious with that in regard, will we ever see kind of corporates fully take on that, I guess, in innovation uh, throughout their entire company? Um, maybe we should level on the term innovation. Um, for us, innovation means to build a mechanism for sustainable renewal. The world has changed, and you need to start being ready for anything that's been thrown at you. And you cannot outsource that. This is, has to be part of the DNA of the organization. Whoever outsources parts of it usually goes back to intent and how do you measure the success of that outsourcing. But it's an organization in the 21st century with technology changes and business model changes happening all the time and faster and faster, you need to organize yourself differently and you cannot outsource that because that's where the culture kicks in. So you need to focus on that first. I don't actually see a lot of outsourcing. I see outsourcing as functions. I don't know, design thinking, whatever the mode de jour is. But at the same time, most organizations are really now finally starting to tackling the internal mess uh, where they need to find ways of attracting talent that stays with them to build a sustainable renewal path. Um, look, there are models where they are outsourcing components, which which you touched on. Um, so, you know, I was recently talking to the Royal Bank of Scotland and um, they've got probably five different models of innovation that they're doing. They they'll will outsource some of it because it's maybe in a more Horizon 3 thinking that they're not ready for, things that are more closer to what they're doing. They've got a sand pit they bring in, you know, their people to, to, to work through. Um, and then they've got, you know, three, four other options. So generally when I'm talking to people that, that really want innovation as part of their DNA, they, they will not outsource it. Um, but they might have an option where, you know, if they think it's a little bit further out and it is a little bit riskier, that, that they will do that. But um, I'm, I'm a big believer, same thing. There's no point doing innovation if you're not really bringing it in t into your core because... It, it'll end up just being a sideshow um, that doesn't have that broader impact. And I know it's harder. Um, it'll be, my job would be so much easier if I, I wasn't <laughs> within the organisation. Um, most of the heartache is actually teaching others and getting, getting it through. Um, but you have to have that pain to make a difference. Um, you have to have that pain to really turn things around. Um, and so I, I, I really don't think you can separate it from the business. Hello. Hi. Hi, guys. Um, so from startup, um, I guess we understand that you guys are looking for us for, for speed and dedication 100% and really have being passionate about startup. I guess from our startup side, looking from a corporate side, um, we look for mass growth to be able to take us to the next level. Do you think you guys are prepared for that? Um, yeah, that's the question. 
I think that's just a byproduct of the scale of the company you're dealing with. Like if it does work, you get the scale. Like it's not whether paid for it or not. I think it's just a giant customer base you get the opportunity to access. Really, that's the simple answer. I don't know if you just if if, if you're interfacing with them, they're not buying you or something. You know, if you're if you're a customer of the of the big organisation, then that's the way that works. I think, but I don't know. Um, look, it, uh, to your point, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but it, it is that long-term relationship to, to, to get there. Um, and I think that's where, you know, you see um, the most successful relationships between a, a startup and a, and a corporate where they do envisage, you know, larger growth, but you've got to work at it over a number of years to get there and it's not going to be an overnight success. Um, and I think that's where it, where it becomes quite... Um, difficult if you only have one big corporate that you're working with that you're not bringing enough money in. So how do you have a, a secondary revenue stream that, that helps you in the day-to-day -day and then the longer term to, to get to that scale? Um, particularly if it's a product that um, the market's not really ready for yet, how do you stick around long enough for when the market's ready to do that? How do you have a second product that is giving you revenue right now? Um, no. Can we finish this? Yeah, yeah. So, um, could we put our hands together and thank the panel for a <laughs> And um, we'd just like to give a small gift to our panellists tonight for, um, you know, spending their time uh, with us to uh, um, share their thoughts on this tricky topic. I'm not sure if we got to the bottom of it, so... Um, they'll be around. I'm sure you can talk to them and really kind of grill them one-on-one. -on -one. So, Kim, ladies first, thank you very much for joining us. Christian, cheers. There you go, Pat. Yep. Nick Tardius. Oh, of course. And um, can we get another round of applause for Dave Swan, who's uh, done a great job on moderating here for us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well done. Cheers. Cheers.